Um, moderating this evening's discussion after the reading will be George Andreu. Mr. Andreu spent his undergraduate years here at Harvard before completing his graduate studies at Yale University. He is now vice president and a senior editor at Alfred A. Knopf, where he has worked for nearly 20 years and where he has been V.S. Naipaul's editor for the past 17. And now it's my pleasure to introduce V.S. Naipaul. V.S. Naipaul was born in Trinidad and spent his university years in England at Oxford University. He has been a writer by profession his entire life and his place between societies has allowed him to explore the borders between colonialism and post-colonialism in both his fiction and nonfiction. His writings have ranged from fiction to travel literature to meditations on the art of writing, and as a body of work, they earned him the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2001. His newest book, The Mask of Africa, is part travel writing, part cultural history, exploring the, the ways belief in ancient religion, modern religion, and political ideology has shaped civilization across the African continent. A starred review in Publishers Weekly notes, ever fair-minded, soberly reflective, and conciliatory, Naipaul offers his sage observations in the hope that by learning more, we accept greater. One of the things I, I explored in this book was the African idea of energy. It's explained in this piece I'm going to read. <coughs> My informant, you'll be introduced to him, and you'll, so you will, you'll get an idea of how the writing was done, how the facts were arrived at, and the effects. Guy Rosatanga Rinio a lawyer and an academic, a former dean of the University of Gabon, said the new religions, Islam and Christianity, are just on the top. Inside us is the forest. And I should have told you that this section comes from Gabon, Gabon in equatorial Africa. In another country, what Rosatanga had said would have sounded too poetic and mystical, too imprecise, someone trying to cover up for a backward country. But Rosatanga wasn't like that. And in Gabon, his words had meaning. Gabon, as big as Britain in area, with a population of less than two million, was an equatorial land of river and forest. It was hot, it steamed, it was malarial. From the air, as you came down to the airport, the shiny river estuary and sea seemed about to overwhelm everything. The forest near the capital was secondary, with plantings of oil palm that spoke of awful labor and heat. A little way inland, the true forest began, primal and tall and tight. The tufted land, green with tints of the palest yellow, became hilly. The cloud shadows didn't fall flat here, as on the sea. They fell unevenly, and these jagged up and down shadows helped you to imagine the contours of the land below the forest canopy. The French were unwilling colonists. They staked out their territory in the 1840s, just 30 years later. After their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, they felt they didn't have the resources for a colonial enterprise, and they wanted to call the whole expensive business off. They actually sent a ship to take their people away. The missionaries, though, refused to leave, and the colony survived. River traffic developed. The great French-Italian explorer Brazza, starting from the river Ogoué, shifting to a tributary, and then continuing on land, was within four days of sighting the mighty Congo River. With the establishment of the colony, there began the logging 
the cutting down of the primal forest. It has never stopped, and yet after more than a century, it doesn't really show. Perhaps it will soon. 30-year per permits have been granted to the Chinese, the Malaysians, and the Japanese. They're more ruthless and better equipped than the people who went before. And at the end of their licenses, there will almost certainly be patches of desert in what was once forest. An international expert says in a very short while, 30% of the forest of Gabor, the focus for centuries of Gabonese love and religious awe, will go. The good news from the same expert is that there may be some kind of international action, some form of subsidy, perhaps, that will make it worthwhile for the Gabonese to leave their forests standing. In the meantime, even with the areas of loss, the forests of Gabon are still one of the great sites of the world. Rosa Tanga Rino, an attractive man in his 40s, was of mixed ancestry, as his double name suggested. His father was French, his mother African. He was educated in Gabon and in Paris, but like many people of mixed ancestry here, he appeared to be embracing the African side of his inheritance. He didn't speak a great deal about his father, and he had married an African woman from the Ivory Coast. When he first came to see me, he was at the end of his university day. He was a very busy man, and he was in his university clothes, a gray double-breasted suit. He was more relaxed the next time. He came with his two children and was informally dressed in a long West African gown, decorated at the neck. This kind of gown was not Gabonese wear and I imagined he was wearing it in tribute to his Ivory Coast wife. I thought the gray suit became him better. When he was going to school, Gabon was rich enough from oil to be a welfare state. His parents, as he said, had to pay only for the school bag. Everything else was free. There was even pocket money for the children when they got to the secondary stage. Every Wednesday, the children lined up for a quinine tablet and milk to help the quinine down. Even the university education in Paris was free. And when Rosatanga married in Paris, the government paid, the Gabon government paid for his wife's fare to Gabon, even though she was from the Ivory Coast. He was a lawyer by profession and thought of himself as a polit political scientist. At the University of Gabon, he also taught political anthropology. It was through these latter studies, no doubt, that he came to his poetic understanding of the place of the forest in the Gabonese mind. It wasn't always like that. His mother was a civil servant, and he was born in a hospital in the town. When he was three, he was taken to the forest. It was a great opportunity to learn the ways of the forest, but he was too young to see it like that. The forest was frightening. It is frightening even now, although in the family house they have a generator. In the forest, night falls very quickly. It is dark by seven. By eight you go to sleep, and you wake up at five. The darkness is dense. To understand the people of Gabon, you have to understand the forest. Rosatanga said, when darkness comes to the forest, there is no sound. But at night, there are different sounds or noises that come from animals hunting. The night, plus the noises, make up our mentality because people are linked to everything in the forest. Thunder isn't just thunder, as it is to you. It is the voice of God. Try to understand that. In our village, 
the most terrifying creature is the owl. We are frightened of the owl because it is a manifestation of evil. If you're out walking and you see an owl, it is a bad omen. And this country of ours is a specific place. Our village is in the mouth of the river. And even if we take a car, we will get nowhere because of the water and the conditions of the roads. It is a primeval area. The forest will always break out, always win. There is a place here called Loango Lodge. You should go and see it. It is heaven and Eden. On the land, you will see elephants. From the same place, you will see whales and dolphins in the sea. When you see that place, you'll understand why I say that this land was not meant for humans. It is for the animals. It is very hard to survive in the forest. You cannot farm here. You might not have noticed it, but we have no cattle. Put these things together, and you will understand why this country, which is half the size of France, has such a small population, malaria, sleeping sickness, and the hot climate. The French, Rosatanga said, fine engineers though they were, never built roads here. There was too much rain, too much water. It washed everything away. The French concentrated on air travel. The first railway was built in 1981 by independent Gabor. It was very expensive, and it was done against the advice of the World Bank. I asked Rosatanga, what is it like physically in the forest? He said with extraordinary passion, it is like a wall. At 50 feet, you cannot see it, as it is so dense and thick. Your vision is limited by the forest, and every one of us in the forest is small. I'll say it again, this land was not made for humans. You have to fight to survive. You don't know it will get you, even in the river. It could be a croc, a water snake, or something living there. God knows what else is there. I asked him, how does this affect your belief? He said, we feel that everything has life, even trees. There is a mystical tree here, a red tree. When we go to the forest, we talk to it and tell it our problems. We also ask its permission to cut its branch or bark. And we tell the tree why we are taking its bark, why we are cutting it. You must tell the tree. All tribes have totems here, and that totem is taboo for them. They can never kill <coughs> or harm their totem. <coughs> they can never hunt it. It can be a crocodile, a parrot. <coughs> a monkey, anything. Forgive me, just a minute, I'll just take this. Because the conditions of life are so hard, everyone in Gabon believes in the forest and in the principle of energy that the forest exemplifies. This is the principle that keeps people going. To lose energy is to fade away. To revive is to get new energy from some source. Rosatanga said, every living thing is energy. Every one of us is like a battery. In our version of the world, even the animals are batteries. That is why we believe there's no such thing as a natural death. If someone dies in the family, we know that someone has taken his energy. To do that, you have to kill the victim, be it man or animal. You kill and take their energy. You also go to the witch doctor to take someone's energy. That is why it sometimes happens that people feel they have to do a ritual sacrifice. We are a matrilineal society. We take our mother's name 
and our mother's eldest brother is the big man in the family. He's so powerful, but if a nephew dies in the family, people suspect the uncle. They think he wanted his nephew's energy. Rosatanga's first experience of the supernatural, linked to the overwhelmingness of the forest, occurred when he was five. It was in his grandmother's village, a traditional village, as he says. He'd gone there for his circumcision rite. That was imperative, a rite of passage to manhood. Whatever formal religion, he meant Christian religion, whatever formal religion the P family process, professed, there were these old African ways that had to be honored and perhaps were more pressing than the former outer faith. One day, during this visit to his grandmother's village, he went with his mother to a plantation, something much smaller than the English word suggested. Only a family allotment, a vegetable patch. His mother was not familiar with the way, and when they were going back to the house, they became lost. They came to a clearing. It was a cemetery, but they didn't know. There they saw something very strange. Four monkeys sitting with red bands tied to their foreheads. Red is a powerful color in Gabo. Only three colors are known, red, black, and white. Eventually they found their way back to the house. His mother told the villagers what they had seen. The villagers said what they had seen were not monkeys, but ghosts. Rosatanga said, I wanted to get away from the village. But the supernatural began to force itself on him now. A long time afterwards, he went to his mother's village with an American friend, the son of, of a foreign friend of his parents. This friend was prospecting for oil in Gabon. When they got to the village, a man told them not to throw litter or in any way pollute the stream that ran by the village. A spirit or jinn lived there, the man said, and didn't like the stream to be polluted. The American said what he had just heard was black magic and nonsense, and to prove his point, he spat in the stream. Rosatanga said, 10 minutes later, there was no water there, and there was a hue and cry. The village was up in arms. We had to do a lot through the local traditional man to placate the jinn or spirit. We spent a lot of money, and after many ceremonies or rituals, the water came back just as quickly as it had vanished. So, in spite of his ancestry and his Paris education, his analytical mind, and in spite of his fierce rationality in other fields, Rosatanga had become a believer in the magic of the forest, and like other believers, had many stories to prove his point. He said, there is another gin of this sort in Lambarene, famous, of course, as the site of the Schweitzer Hospital. This gin in Lambarene lived in the river. We needed a ferry to cross that river, and the government decided to build a bridge. The old people in the area warned the engineers about the gin and told them that they should ask the gin's permission first. The engineers, who were Dutch, just laughed and carried on. Every day a worker died. People became very frightened, and even the engineers thought they should stop the work. They said they would bring an exorcist, along with the local witch doctor, to placate the gin. They went and brought the traditional doctor, and he performed many rituals, and they were finally allowed to build the bridge. I believe these forest spirits a link to the psyche of our people, even if they live in the city. That is one reason, Rosatanga said, why the American evangelical churches have been so successful here. They also invoke the Lord's Spirit to remove the devil. This is like what we do when we go to the witch doctor to remove the devil. 
the principle is the same. The common ground is the spirit. I asked him if he could define the religion of the forest more closely. He said in a precise academic way, we cannot call it a religion. It is a set of beliefs. We don't pray to God in our understanding. God is not accessible to humans. It, and he meant the idea of God, has many other problems and has no time for humans. In forest belief, the organic world, the world that mattered, was like a pyramid. The first level, Rossetanga said, at the minerals and ore. The second level at the trees and flora. And the third level at the animals. The fourth level at the human beings. If it had stopped there, it would have sounded like a version of the, Af of the Elizabethan chain of being. But Rossetanga went on, and it soon became clear that this concept he was talking about was a local one. He said, in the human beings, you have divisions. Children are spiritually stronger than the middle-aged, who are useless and blind. The elderly, like the children, are spiritually strong because they're about to go to the new place. Children are strong because they have just come from the new place. They are pure and still have the sight. They can sense evil as they have an open mind. Sometimes they cry because they see too much. And then you have to take them to a strong traditional master. He places a stone on their forehead to stop the sight. But you have to be very careful because too much of the stone can turn the child into an idiot. As for the old, Rosatanga said, they are special because they have power and they are close to the ancestors. Only the ancestors can intercede with God. You have to keep the bones and skull of your ancestor and feed it rum and talk to it when you're in trouble. This was what Rosatanga himself did. So in this matter, at least, he was not talking with the distance of the anthropologist. He said, before leaving the village, I go and put alcohol and food on my mother's grave and my grandfather's grave. I liked him for saying that. I asked whether there were other ways of worshipping the ancestor. He said, every family has an elder who can talk to the ancestor. There is one man in every family chosen for the job. This elder keeps the bones and skull. The way to worship is through initiation. Initiation is the fundamental right and practice. I had heard much in Gabon about initiation. Everybody in Gabon talks about it, or so it seems. It requires a master, an all-night ceremony with dancing and drumming and eating the bitter root of a hallucinogenic plant, the iboga. The right is secret. And even at the end of my time in Gabon, I didn't feel I'd begun to understand the, the idea or importance of initiation. I wanted to know whether in this ritual of honoring the ancestor, there was also contained the idea of virtue, the idea of the good life. Rosatanga said, no, the ancestors are there only to provide an answer to your problems and give you what you want. And about initiation, he said, you have no say in the village or its matters until you are initiated. To be recognized as a man, you have to be circumcised in the village. And that itself is a ritual. You take the child's foreskin and bury it in the ground. Then you plant a banana tree or sucker. This is the boy's banana, and you watch it grow. When it gives its first fruit, there is a big ceremony. Since the banana is a sexual symbol of the boy's manhood, the boy will eat the first banana, and the rest of the fruit is rubbed all over his body. No woman must be nearby or see the ceremony. I asked him, are you saying that if you follow the various rituals, you need not be afraid of the forest? He said, 
you remain afraid. Initiation and ritual only give you a path through the forest. You are not protected against others, women especially. Women are very important in this society. They are the real power. A woman may not exercise power, but she gives it to her son. We are a matrilineal society, and women give life. The country was not made for, for men. Women's bodies are stronger, and so they are witches. There are many ritual sacrifices where the eyes are removed and tongues torn out of living victims. Every day, there's a ritual sacrifice. White skin is very prized here, and for that reason, I cannot let my light-skinned children out in the evening. I asked, what is the importance of the tongue? He said, they remove the tongue to get energy. I asked him, what do you think about that? He said, there is no name. It is too shocking. It was a relief to hear him say that. He had spoken of energy in such a positive way. I thought he might have been more accepting. He said, power is everything. It is always sought out. There is a lot of rural migration, and so you have many forest people living in the cities. During elections, you have to be very careful because of ritual sacrifice. You have to go every day to pick up your children from school. I was 25 when I did my PhD, and they think because I'm a lawyer and successful and work late into the night, I'm a wizard and in a secret society. At night, normal people sleep. They will think that you're a wizard too. And so far as the president is concerned, he is the king of the king of the wizards. I asked him, when the forests get thinner with the logging, will these forest ideas fade or change? He said, maybe, but I'm not sure. People who have not gone to a village for 20 years still have the same mindset. It is still a forest mind. It is a challenge, and I'm not sure that we will win. You'll see people here in Libreville splashing about in the sea. That is an important thing. The people of Gabon didn't like sea bathing. Generally, Gabonese people will not go to the sea because it is not our domain. I said, does this fatalism depress you? He said, it doesn't. I know a lot of educated people who go to the witch doctor and spend a lot of money. This society works with this belief. All our music, painting, sculpture, everything is linked with the forest. And that's the end of Mr. Rossatanga in my book. Thank you. I thought we might begin um, by just speaking generally about your relationship to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that you've been writing about for many years. You went to Africa first in 1967? 66. 66. Mm -hmm. And that was in Uganda. In Uganda, yes. And I also uh, made little journeys to Kenya and Tanganyika. Mm. So that area of East Africa. East yes. Africa, yeah. Uh, although this is mainly in West Africa. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you've written about Africa in... You've had several novels that are set largely in Africa or substantially in Africa. There's uh, In a Free State, Bend in the River, um, and Half a Life also mm. has a bit of that. And you do say that to, to write about a place in a novel, you really have to know a place. Mm -hmm. um, so the question, and you have, of course, done uh, some very famous essays about Africa. I think, for instance, of um, uh, The Crocodiles of Yamasukro, which in some ways is a sequel to yes, yes, uh, yes. The, the, the Ivory Coast chapter yes, yes. Um, in this book. But why is it that you have deferred um, doing this big kind of book about Africa? Um, how does it come about now? Well, very simply, you know, one is always looking for the subject for a book. And you 
cast your mind down of what you know, what you've written, and uh, the things you have done come up to you, and you wonder whether you can do them. Uh, so there's, that's the main reason, because uh, a book has to be nicely done. A book has to, to be beautifully written and shaped and everything. Uh, and I was able to do this with this material because I, I knew at least a quarter of it before, before writing. Uh, you mentioned, um, in particular, um, um, a, a sort of surprise, uh, uh -huh. a, a certain surprise yes. in what you found, um, something that was not um, um, an awareness that you didn't have from that 25% that you already knew. And that, um, that surprise is um, expressed in, in one particular uh, paragraph of the uh, flap copy, actually, which you kindly contributed to in addition to writing the whole book. Um, <laughs> and I wondered uh, if I might get you, and we've, we've enjoyed listening to you um, for a good while, but I wondered if I might just get you to just okay. read that paragraph as well, which was the first paragraph that I had read, I think, entering into this. I had expected that over the great size of Africa, the practices of magic would significantly vary, but they didn't. The diviners everywhere wanted to throw the bones to read the future, and the idea of energy remained a constant, to be tapped into by the ritual sacrifice of body parts. In South Africa, body parts, most, mainly of animals, but also of men and women, made a mixture of what is known as battle medicine. To witness this, to be given some idea of its power, was to be taken far back to the beginning of things. To reach that beginning was the purpose of my book. Thank you. Um, that whole notion of the beginning of things, um, it seems that the, the earth religions so described in the book, are really governed by some notion of the beginning of things. Yes. And why yes. is that the, um, why does that predominate in, um, in traditional African religions? Why the beginning of things? Well, not, not just cosmologically, but, but that, that el elementalism, um, um, that's what is, George. I can't. It wasn't my business to find out why. It was my business just to consider what I saw. So, what did you make of how the, these um, these coincidences that you observed? These um, these commonalities, because you do a very good job of of uh, defining specificities of of, yes, of yes, a number yes. of these things. But um, one is struck. Um, by the um, by the recourse to the same ritual gestures, and does it bespeak a relation to um, to life itself? I mean, what what else is religion in that yes. in that sense? Yes. Is it yes. so? Is it a, an issue of the way that one lives in relation to nature? Um, what nature? Uh, I was I was listening to your you know description about the forest. Yes. The forest is you know. Very dark, very fast, very imposing. Yes. Um, is there any other way? Could, could any other religion have possibly evolved under such circumstances? Yes, one lives in relation to the physical world, the strange physical world like that. Uh, and then one has to find ways of uh, going through the world. What Rosatango is talking about finding ways through the dangers of the forest. You have to find ways through the dangers of the world. Uh, and this takes us right back to the ancient world, the classical world, where you always had to understand 
how to deal with, with great events. Uh, if you were going to fight a war, you had to take advice. You took advice from the, from the spirits, the gods. You found out what they were, killing an animal and uh, examining the liver or the heart or some such, some such part of the body. And that told you. And uh, if you did this all the time, in Roman belief, which I suppose would be the same as African belief, if you did this all the time, you would be all right. You would be, uh, you would be living according to the rules. Uh, so I think it's living according to the rules. The augurs and so on. Yes, 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 yes. And would you say then that there is a kind of progress, because the Romans eventually gave that up. Is there a kind of progression from um, religions connected to that kind of relationship to the universe and then what follows, say, in the Western world? I mean, you mentioned that uh, Rosantanga says, you know, there isn't a kind of, um, they are not concerned with a notion of the good life uh, in, no, in, in, no, in Gabon, no, in the no. traditional religion. As um, Rasatanga says, there's no idea of the good life in honoring the ancestors. It's just the thing you have to do. Mm. So there's a kind of, but, but they do have uh, an overlay, do they not? Yes. Of these. Yes. Um, these newer religions, the, the newer imported religions. religions the imp more organized and which give them a, a kind of a set of things to hold on to. Rasatanga says, what you have in the forest cannot be called a religion. Uh, yes. You know, it's a series of beliefs. And I suppose the imported religions do give people a set of belief. But they give them something more. They give them, they they give them something more, it seems, in relation to the, yes, yes. the, the um, what is frightening about yes, this yes. existence. Yes, yes. Um, you mentioned that the the afterlife is the most oh, yes, attractive yes, notion. Yes, yes, that's because it's so hard to understand. Let's suppose you were a missionary for Islam or Christianity. How would you go about and tell people about your religion? Uh, if you could tell them that in this religion, if you were a Muslim, there's the afterlife, which is very, very important. And you can li live fully in the afterlife. You're h that's half the battle for you. Uh, it's a good deal. Yes, 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 yes. And um, this, the, the book itself is, is very much a, about, or it's similar in form, I think, to books that you have written about Islam. and. Um, um, two books in particular that I have in mind, um, um, Among the Believers. Yes. Uh, yes. The first thing, actually, that I uh, read of yours, even, even before coming here, um, and uh, Beyond Belief. And both of those uh, take up the subject of Islam in, um, uh, in the lands of the converted people, the non-Arabic um, yes. yes. um, cultures of Asia. Um, and you say, um, well, you, I, I'll read a little from the, um, the preface to Beyond, uh, the prologue to Beyond Belief. Um, a, convert's world, a convert's worldview alters. His holy places are in Arab lands. His sacred language is Arabic. His idea of history alters. He rejects his own. He becomes, whether he likes it or not, a part of the Arab history. The convert has to turn away from everything that is his. The disturbance for societies is immense, and even after a thousand years, can remain unresolved. Yes. Um, that's a heavy trip. Um, is it? Um, is it like that in in African um, uh, versions of Islam? Um, there's you you describe in those books famously a sort of neurosis, really, uh, about the individual sense of himself and the. Um, the sense that is imposed by 
this alternate identity, which one must assume. Um, I wonder how, <coughs> how much of that bears upon uh, the African uh, Muslim sense in the places, at least in the places you visited. No, I think the African have absorbed these things so quickly and easily because of this idea of the, uh, the presence of the afterlife. Uh, and this idea of the, uh, the spirit world, which... Which coexists. Yes, yes. And you see, it, when people try to tell Africans that witchcraft is bad, etc., they're perforce compelled to use the language of, of religion. They talk about spirits and things yes. like that. So it looks as though they, they, what they're telling the poor Africans is, you can believe in spirits, believe in good spirits. You know, don't believe in bad ones. Uh, We'd be telling a Christian, don't believe in the devil. Don't, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Some of those uh, books or booklets uh, or leaflets about religion, of a good religion, come so terribly close to uh, accepted religion, you know, come very, very close to it. Uh, but would you say that the, you do, you do mention, for instance, in one place, um, I think it's in Uganda, yes, um, 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 on the Kabaka Mutesa um, in the, the 19th century um, had um, brought in the, uh, uh, the Muslims. Um, at some point, he decided to turn his back on that yes. and let the Christians have a go, too. Yes. So he, he complicated things quite a bit. Um, and you say, you wonder whether... Um, uh, whether he wouldn't have regretted this and thought that Africa left in this matter uh, might have arrived at its own more valuable synthesis of old and new. Um, so I'm wondering, um, would things be going better now in Africa um, were it not for the um, um, imported religions? If the, if the I think it's worth thinking about and talking about. Uh, yes, I think it might be worth talking about. Uh, the idea that the past had to be wiped away is a very frightening thing for people. And Africans themselves don't like it. You see, people in a place like Uganda, who might be given Christian first names, they take the names and they can be proud of them, but there's a corner of their souls that rejects reject this idea of surrender and wiping away the past. And I think that many of the people in the world who have accepted foreign faith feel like that. I think it's, it's something to be understood. They know in a part of themselves, this is just not me. Exactly, not completely. Not completely. not completely, can never be. Yes. Can never be. Yes. Yes. Um, there's one other uh, uh, overlay of uh, faith that complicates the picture yet again, and that is, one might say, the, the, uh, the quasi religion of the, the cult of um, the leader in, yes. in some of these places. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of the uh, case of Ufuet Bonyi in Ivory Coast. Yes. Um, who um, had a kind of pharaonic uh, cult that you went and visited. Um, you, you, you saw two things that uh, uh, I remember most vividly. Um, in Yamasukro, um, uh, the, the crocodiles, yes, yes, part of his yes. cult was a, a moat full of and crocodiles. And he manufactured a kind of a religion and a cult around them. It was all manufactured. With a kind of a nod yes, to the, yes, the immediacy yes, of nature yes. and probably energy yes. and, and... There's the palace the, uh, around the village where he was born, which he's honoring, and there he's built a moat. And what he did with the moat was to put crocodiles in. 
And it's so sad seeing the baby crocs clambering up to, onto bits of concrete now. The color is so strange, you know? Uh, and the water is getting so dirty. Uh, it's such a it's such a misuse of nature. So the the crocs are hanging in there, so to speak. <laughs> They're hanging in there, but, yes. But without the um, yes, without yes. Um, yes. Uh, the cult, yes. and there is no cult any longer. Yes, um, yes. It, it loses its meaning. It's exactly. So the ritual remains. The ritual remains. I don't know for how much longer. Right. It, it might. Uh, it might fade away. A little heartier is another one of his, um, uh, still a form of self-aggrandizement, although um, perhaps nominally uh, uh, built to the glory of God. The Catholic cathedral there, which is meant uh, to be a replica of yes. St. Peter's. Not a replica, so much you can't do the replica. It would bankrupt even an African country. But it very nearly did in this case. Yes, yes. yes. He gave a little section of it. A little bit of the Bernini colonnade, a little bit of the Baldaquin uh, covering St. Peter. He puts that at the back. It's not covering a saint, but it's there at the back. Uh, so he's covering himself in every way. There's the African faith, and there's the Christian faith, yes. honoring it. Yes. Um. One, uh, w one other thing, um, um, one is struck um, by your feeling for animals uh, <laughs> in this story. In fact, um, um, the, the, the crocodiles remind one because the, they were fed live chickens uh, yes, yes, yes. On, a, on a regular basis. And you do, um, um, you do rather uh, implicate um, the treatment of animals in the measure of humanity, um, which is a somewhat uh, new notion in, in the history of civilization. I mean, we have animal rights uh, yes. as a thing nowadays. Yes. Um, I think this, this town's probably very, are there any, anybody wearing fur tonight? It's pretty cold. <laughs> um, but how is it that, um, how is it that we should think about that, 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 our, that our very humanity is implicated in the way that we treat animals? Because obviously the, traditional, the traditions of religion have always been to sacrifice. The Abrahamic religions carry this on. It's not particular to the African religions, although it does seem to be more um, varied um, in the ones that you discuss here. Um, but um, there is something fundamental about um, the misuse of animals, that seems the to... The misuse of animals, yes. That sets, yes, you, yes, that sets yes. you off in the book. Yes. And I think it would be wonderful if one arrived at a feeling that, like, you know, the Blake poem? Yes. A robin redbreast in a cage puts heaven in a rage. Yes. A horse misused upon the road cries aloud yes. for, heaven, for human blood. Things like that. So we, it's a long time... It's been a long time, the ideas working on us, that uh, animals should be treated as sentient creatures and should be given a kind of dignity. Probably not rights, because rights offend people. The idea of rights, uh, rights belong to people who think, to people who, who've worked it out. And animals can't do that thinking. In a way, we have to do it for them. Um, shall we take a few? OK. Someone just left you a phone number, but I'll just give you that. <laughs> <laughs> Very naughty. Lady and I follows up there. Um, maybe you understand this question, because this, uh, 
this, this could only uh, come from Harvard. Um, to, uh, to what extent will Africa be a beneficiary of natural resource super cycle? What does that mean? <laughs> Sir. I asked the question. I, you know, if you see what's happened, say, in places like Brazil or Russia, they've had this virtuous cycle of rising commodity prices, which have created tax revenues and uh, the emergence of a middle class, um, and where GDP per capita is growing sort of rapidly, um, savings is increasing, and, and societies which were very impoverished all of a sudden are reveling in So the effect prosperity. of the commodities market and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, because they tend to be quite commodity-rich countries. Right, yeah. So is there, where's the rescue in Africa from natural resources? I mean, we're talking about nature and the appreciation and, and so on, but um, um, you have, you know, obviously in the, in the Middle East, um, uh, mineral wealth, um, yes. Well, has created some other problems, but certainly it has uh, um, it has raised the standard of living. Um, where is that in Africa? Do you expect that in Africa? Is that inevitable, or is it inevitable that Africa it be? Africa has a lot of money. A place like Nigeria is really very rich. Yes. Uh, there is a large, rich section of the population. Uh, whether this can go down, I don't know. I don't know. Whether uh, there could be a broadening of the, of the economic base. But I think that, you know, we don't live in a, in a little enclosed world any longer. We're all of us exposed to many conflicting things. And I suppose many ideas will now get down to, to the rich folk of, of Nigeria. And there'll be movement, there'll be movement, a very slow and painful thing, but I think it's possible. Africa cannot just be isolated. Well, it's um, certainly one, uh, something one hopes for, and, and the logic of it is clear, but one can't help thinking, for example, when you go to South Africa, um, the, you mentioned, for instance, that um, um, it was easier to rebuild um, uh, East Berlin than it would be to restore parts of um, um, parts of South Africa that had that had been developed and now had fallen into a kind of disrepair after the fall of apartheid yes. now, no one wouldn't uh, uh, say that was a good thing, mm -hmm. but it came at a kind of price it seems in what yes, you, yes, in yes, what you say yes, yes. Um, can that be fixed i s i don 't know how they 'll do it really. But they have to. They have to. They have to. There's always a bit of um, the kind of what's your favorite color question, but this is um, uh, what, what has been your happiest moment in your writing career? I, I should like to know. What? The happiest moment in your writing career. I suppose it would have occurred when one was very young. Because, you know, there are no happy moments now. <laughs> <laughs> when you are young, the future is a great big ball around you. Anything is possible in that future. So if you do a good review for the new states, for the new field, it's good. It can make you quite happy although it's a petty business. Uh, I wonder if I've had happy moments like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're in the past, because now I'm, uh, I know the future is small and eternally shrinking around me. So well, that's, that's a cosmic uh, problem. <laughs> but, but, it, but could it be that the change of the, the world of letters and one's, you know, no, the, the relative importance of that in any in, in, in these developed cultures that, yes, that we live yes, in, so-called. Yes. Um, May I ask the questioner what was his happy moment? Oh yes, if we can find the question. If we can find the questioner. 
Yeah, it's pretty easy to ask it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one of the things that can't possibly make you happy, it certainly doesn't make me happy, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the pettiness of uh, 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 British literary politics. Um, it seems they really have nothing to do with their time, uh, yeah. but um, um, personal attack. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering, you don't seem to have that problem here. You get, um, you get reviews that are about your books, whereas... About the books, oh, they, they get... Reviews of yourself. Yes, reviews of me, yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. What do you make of that? It's fatiguing. <laughs> so what I do, <laughs> what I do, I pay no attention. So it looks rather grand. He doesn't read the reviews, you know. But you've got to do it to, to keep a bit of your sanity. Yes. Uh, it's not easy being a writer, really. Um, well, uh, in consideration of that, um, I think we'll end it there. Um, but um, um, I thank you, and I thank um, all of you. And uh, I hope you'll want to buy a book or come and say hello or both. And um, we'll see you again. <laughs>